Mike Gallagher, Palantir's head of defense and former U.S. congressman, gives a fascinating answer in regards to how Palantir is transforming one of the least sexy but most critical industries to America. This is huge for America and Palantir. Check out this clip. Through your work at Palantir, you've been able to see where the industrial base is picking up AI to, to sort of speed along and supercharge what it's doing. I'm curious if you can share some examples in some of the spaces where, where you're active through Palantir, or where workers are using AI to free themselves from drudgery so they can build better and faster and get back to the thing that they really actually want to be doing, which is building the things that America needs to stay strong and to win this fight. Well, where I'm most excited about this, and perhaps it's because I represented a shipbuilding district, or perhaps it's because you know, I'm a Marine Corps officer, which means I'm a naval officer. But I think we have a massive opportunity to revitalize American shipbuilding right now. The Trump administration has rightly placed this as one of their highest priorities. And in our work at Palantir, we've already started to see some of the positive effects that applying actual commercial technology, AI-enabled software to manufacturing can have, the transformative effect it can have. For example, at Anderil, it's already delivered a 200-fold increase in supply chain responsiveness. That's now accelerating the production of unmanned surface vessels, which are critical to Indo-Pacific deterrence against China. Engineers now operate with full situational awareness when they're sequencing tasks, when they're resolving procurement friction, when they're adapting designs in real time. At Saronic, another great customer of ours, it's helping build the foundation for a fully digitized shipyard. So you're going to have procurement, design, manufacturing unified into a single hyper-intelligent system where every input is tracked, every decision is contextualized, every risk is anticipated. And I think what's going to emerge on the other side of that is an industrial shipyard machine with the agility of a startup and the precision of a defense prime. And this model, powered by Palantir software, is already scaling among America's allies. So on the Korean Peninsula, for example, HD Hyundai's flagship shipyard is operating at a tempo and scale that the United States hasn't matched in decades. South Korea now builds nearly 30% of the world's ships, and Hyundai alone commands 17% of global output. One yard there delivers nearly five times more commercial vessels than the entire U.S. shipbuilding base combined. So I think ship, shipbuilding for me is just this perfect example of legacy manufacturing that's critical to U.S. national security, where the new administration clearly sees it as a priority, where you're starting to see the non-traditionals and foreign innovators do some really interesting things. And if we can just apply that to American shipyards, I think we can, we can produce a quantum leap. One final story to illustrate how absurd the current situation is vis-a-vis -vis China. I remember going to a master ship repair yard in Southern California in my first term when I was a freshman member of Congress. And they were just talking about how they just built a dry dock, right? Dry dock, big structure you need to repair ships. And they were telling me, and so I'm like, so where did, where did you build it? Like, how, how did it work? And I'm like, well, we built it in China. So you think about it, like, we're building dry docks on the West Coast. So we have more ships to confront China, but we have to, the, we need China to build the things necessary to repair those ships. And in order to get it from the Pacific back to the West Coast, you have to cut it into three pieces, ship it, weld it back together. And they're like, oh yeah, we almost couldn't weld it back together because local politics were such that people were worried about underwater welders forcing the fish to go deaf in the harbor. And I'm like, come on, America, we got to get our crap together. So you're starting to see that change. I think we have an opportunity right now. So we just heard of some great examples of which Palantir is able to add value to some very interesting case studies, and rule being one of them. How important is Palantir, in your opinion, Hans, to heavy industry? How much of a willingness do you think there will be of these less sexy legacy industries to adopt technology a bit like Palantir's and utilize AI and all the bells and whistles that come along with that? Will it maybe be high because it's existential to these industries? And then also, how important is it to America from both a sort of robust supply chains point of view and a national security point of view that this technology is adopted in these critical industries as soon as possible? You know, that's a great question. I think, you know, in today's day and age where we have this very 
intense geopolitical competition with China and the United States. The heavy industry portion of the economy has come back into focus for so many people. And if we want to not only catch up, but potentially be able to leapfrog China in this thing, then we really need to apply our best software specifically to heavy industry. And that's one of the things that Palantir has known and understood for a long time, and they've been specifically working towards this. So, you know, this type of topic that Mike Gallagher is speaking to in this clip is not something that Palantir is, you know, just thinking about now in response to everything that we've seen happen over the last couple of years. They actually forecasted and predicted that we would be in this type of a moment globally where there is a lot of tension between geopolitical rivals and that in that world that our globally connected supply chains would be challenged and would need to be secured using software in a much more robust way and that our as a result our heavy industry would then actually need to be supercharged and so that is part of the foundational goal and mission that Palantir was built to solve. And so I think it is something that it's critically important for many heavy industries to adopt to help them become more efficient. You know, Mike Gallagher said it very well there that we want these companies to be able to act with the precision and power that comes with the size of our traditional defense primes to be able to deliver, you know, exceptional outcomes. But at the same time, we don't want them to be these big, slow-moving behemoths that we see in companies like Boeing these days or Raytheon that unfortunately just don't seem to be able to keep up with the quick pace of changes going on. We want them to be able to operate more like startups, more like Anduril. And so that's one of the things that Palantir Software is built to enable, that one of the things about operating these big companies is that you, as the company grows, you start facing a lot of challenges with coordination, with communication, and then with situational awareness. You have data that lives in silos here, there, or wherever, or processes that don't necessarily scale to large numbers of people. And Palantir's Foundry and AIP software really helps to solve those communications challenges, the situational awareness challenges, and the coordination challenges that come with that so that you can make high, high quality decisions. And you know, there's a whole field of business software that's called business intelligence. It's been focused on these exact types of problems, but none of those other companies have ever approached the problem quite from the ground up perspective that Palantir has with their ontology architecture that is not only something that solves those problems, but solves it in a flexible way that, you know, the same foundry and AIP software that works well in one company because of the ability to define the underlying shape of the software to fit different industries and different organizations, that's something that we've never really seen from other business intelligence type solutions that operate at this scale. And that is what is so powerful when you look at something like heavy industry, because a lot of times these industries are businesses where you have super high costs, but then also low margins. And so like if we just ran through an example, you might be looking at a company that makes $100 billion a year in revenue, but it costs them $90 billion a year in order to make that revenue. So they only have like $10 billion of gross revenue left over then to pay a lot of the expenses that they have. And so then, you know, even if they are super efficient and say they are able to have costs of only $5 billion and then net profits of another $5 billion from within that thing, that would be, you know, a net margin of 5% on $100 billion of revenue is $5 billion worth of annual net income. And that is like the types of scale that we're talking about. So if a company like that can solve a lot of their coordination problems, they can reduce waste, they can make their supply chain more resilient. There's like so many different things that they can do to wring a little bit of cost out of that. And Palantir is exceptionally good at doing that to them or for them very quickly, you know, maybe in the first year, they could take out just a little bit more than 1% of their costs. So we, we could say they're going to take out a billion dollars worth of their costs from that 90 billion and take it down to 89 billion. Well, that means that now they're making $11 billion in gross revenue instead of 10. And that entire billion pretty much minus what they pay to Palantir, which we'll say, you know, we'll just say that's $100 million. That's $900 million that flows directly through to net 
profits for your company. And that's almost a 20% increase over, you go from making 5 billion in net income or net profits to 5.9 billion in net profits. And so, yeah, like I said, that's more than a 20% increase over your year over year profits. And that's like huge numbers for, you know, big corporations like this. So that's the reason that, you know, Palantir is able to provide value to these people, charge these high numbers. And then you asked about, you know, are heavy industries going to be willing to adopt this because it's existential? And I think the answer to that question is definitely yes. Maybe not every competitor in the industry. But for example, we've seen in the aviation industry, Airbus has adopted Palantir. And since they started working with Palantir, we've seen the relative deterioration of Boeing, who did not adopt Palantir and has all kinds of issues, versus Airbus, which has continued to become stronger and stronger and stronger as a company. It's like the aviation industry as a whole is benefiting from Palantir. Boeing individually is not benefiting from Palantir, but Airbus is increasing year on year the size of the contracts that they're doing with Palantir, the number of places that they have Palantir deployed within their company. And then, you know, if you let that situation play out over time, then you can see a future where, you know, all of the major players that are left standing within a big industry like that are definitely powered by Palantir or something equivalent to it that allows them to compete with a company like Airbus. And I think that's the same dynamic that you're also witnessing here that Mike is talking about in shipbuilding with companies like Anduril and Saronic. So all you need to see is one major player like an HD Hyundai at the large end of the shipbuilding spectrum to adopt Palantir and to really put it to work in their business at massive scale for then that to put a lot of competitive pressure on other people in the market. So I think that's, you know, a lot of other people will just by force of competition end up needing to adopt Palantir. Um, And then the ones that don't, I think, will eventually die off because they will be outcompeted. So then to circle back to your last question about like, how important is this for the United States that we have our heavy industries be able to be more efficient and more competitive on a global stage because they're able to coordinate better, they're able to have more resilient supply chains, they're able to save waste and avoid costs that are unnecessary and do all of these things. And, you know, I think it's just incredibly important. I think that's one of the reasons why I've been invested in Palantir and believe in the mission of Palantir, because they are going to be a key critical component in the competitiveness of the United States on a global stage in the future. And we do, you know, face stiff competition from China on a number of fronts. And we need to meet that competition head on, not necessarily, you know, hopefully to avoid any sort of conflict. But I think they are determined to be very, very strong competitors. And if we would like to avoid that conflict, we need to also be determined to be very, very competent competitors as well. And you know, heavy industry is going to be one of the key battlegrounds where that is determined because at the end of the day, wars are won by the underlying logistics and economies behind the conflict as much as anything else. I mean, that's one of the reasons that you can see the dynamics in Ukraine playing out the way that they are, that the Russian economy is very large compared to the Ukrainian economy. Um, Their industrial base is very large. And so that allows them to just sustain levels of losses and casualties and costs that are in excess of what Ukraine can support. And so then Ukraine is left needing to be supported by a whole host of other people. And, you know, as far as the U.S. is concerned, if we were in that type of position, there's not really that many people who can come to help to save us. So we need to develop these types of capabilities amongst our allies and in-house here in the United States as well in a robust way. Uh, Because if we don't, there's not going to be, you know, a lot of capability to save us if we get into a sticky situation. So we are seeing Palantir get adopted in quite a lot of these non-sexy, industrial, tricky industries and niches, supply chain being one, manufacturing being another, shipbuilding being another. And we're seeing it have a large impact on workers, their efficiencies, the amount they can get done. If you extrapolate this, if Palantir can make reasonably light work of heavy shipbuilding as an industry and can add value there. And we've also seen what they can do in government. We've also seen what they do in military. We've seen what they do in supply chain. Does this signal what a versatile product Palantir has built 
and what they're able to implement. And if we're able to then extrapolate that out to all different sectors and industries, I mean, I think they can really add value to pretty much every single niche, every single sector out there. Does this signal that Palantir has a gigantic TAM and total addressable market opportunity here? Yeah, I would definitely agree. I mean, the diversity of their customer set and the problems that they solve is incredible. Um, You know, if you really look at all the industries that they have their fingers in, it is quite wide ranging. And I think the big thing that this shows is the correctness of the original customer set that they pursued, you know, by going into highly important critical and difficult operating environments like special forces deployed in war zones to begin building, you know, the whole foundation of all this software. Like that's where Palantir started was, you know, working with special forces in the Middle East in the early 2000s while they were building the the first version of their software, Project Gotham, that getting the software to work well in that environment, relatively so, was It required building in a lot of flexibility with the platform and thinking about the different architectures for solutions, the different structures that problems present themselves with. And all of that then was something that it took many, many years for them to build this type of flexibility into the the product. Eventually, they were able to take that, you know, apply it for other government agencies, not just special forces, and then from there expand not just to government agencies and special forces, but then out to corporate customers as well. And every time they, you know, expanded out their client set, they went back and improved the underlying flexibility of their system to where now it is so extensible. It covers so many things like we've talked about. So I think that's a great observation just about how flexible their software is. And then when you ask the follow-up question, what does that mean for Palantir's TAM? Well, I do believe it's very large. You know, it's certainly there are a very limited number of even highly competent technology companies that can't benefit from having Palantir software running with them in-house. You know, Elon is famous for they build all of their software in-house. They're not partnering with Palantir necessarily, but Panasonic, who is one of their partners that builds batteries there in Nevada for them, they actually do use Palantir. And so within Tesla supply chain, even Palantir comes up as an important company providing software that helps these companies to operate more efficiently and more effectively. So if it's something that even those types of clients are using, then that does show like, I think the it's the minority of large businesses or even medium sized businesses that can't benefit from Palantir uh, and their foundry and AIP platforms, especially when you take into account the way that Alex Carp thinks about how they actually generate their own revenue is that they want to make you $5 or $10. And then once they have done that, they want to ask you in return for $1 or $2. And it's hard for people with, you know, any business sense whatsoever to say no to that proposition. But that said, you know, they still are somewhat limited in their ability to onboard new clients, new customers, and they're certainly limited in their sales team capacity. Uh, But they get so much attention from so many ways that I think they have, you know, more people that want to do business with them uh, than they have the ability to digest at this point in time. And that said, they're growing their ability to digest new clients clients rapidly. And this is what's driving just the insane growth in their overall commercial business around the world and their profits, revenues, operating leverage, operating margin, all these things. Before we wrap, I have to say a huge thank you to my co-host, David. Besides being a great co-host with a great accent, David has been one of the key figures behind the scenes helping me to grow this channel from 1,000 to over 16,000 subscribers and to put out regular shows that reach millions of views every year. When he's not moonlighting with me, he usually works with businesses who want to leverage YouTube to grow their online presence, and he's looking to take on more. If you want to get more clients and more brand awareness for your business using YouTube, I definitely recommend him. You can book a free call with him using the link in the description below.